get louder. Okay. I don't know. Is it louder? Okay. Okay, so uh, you look at these things, these funny things. They are examples of uh, polyhedra. Okay. And uh, uh, these side are nicer. And for example, uh, on the right hand side, you have polyhedra with a hole. And we, we will not consider those. Okay. So those things are out. We, we consider the polyhedra without holes. Okay. And also, most likely, we consider polyhedra like this. This is called uh, convex. Uh, these things, you have something. Uh, it's not. Uh, anyway. You have something not uh, <laughs> not convex. I can define convex mathematically, but uh, but I guess from the picture is is it's clear. Now these the um, things on the right are not the same as things on the left. Okay. So now if you look at things on the left, you can actually sort of press it onto two dimensions, and then you get a graph. So, so Euler's formulas are for for the definitely there's a version for polyhedra. So it says the the number of faces the, in polyhedra and the number of faces is clearly defined. You can really see it. Right? So the number of faces and number of edges are uh, again is is very clear, and number of vertices are very clear. So you can count the the number of faces of a polyhedra like on the on the left. No, don't, don't consider the, these. So the and uh, the number of edges and number of vertices it satisfies Euler's formula. So uh, now from the polyhedras to planar graph, well there is we have to uh, to use our imagination, where we look at these uh, wonderful uh, uh, graphs from internet, right? So, so these things are, uh, okay, for example, uh, uh, for example, these are all uh, planar graphs. Uh, uh, okay, so let, let's point. To these, right? So these are, so it's a graph. You can draw it on the plane without uh, cross any edge. Okay. So these graphs actually, you can think of them as uh, is obtained from polyhedra. From polyhedra, you can you can uh, can somehow squeeze it onto the, the two-dimensional plane. Then you get things like this. Okay. So so then you can count the number of uh, Faces or the, the cells and edges and vertices, just like you count the the polyhedra. The only exception is polyhedra has a face behind us, uh, but on this plane you have to count actual one, which is the one uh, to the infinity. If you think think of that as a, a face, then that is the same as polyhedra. Okay. Uh, so the proof will be so what we are what we have done is we are going to sh we have we have shown that for polyhedral graphs or for planar graphs we have this Euler's uh, formula and then we want to count the number of uh, so we have we have a corollary which says which counts the number of uh, the relation between the number of faces and number of edges. So the the relation is if it is a maximum, if if the graph has maximum number of edges, and then all the faces are triangles. So therefore, you have a, the relation of three times the number of faces is equal to two times the number of edges. So then we use that to derive something. Uh, I hope if you think of the the polyhedras, and then it is clearer about what are the faces and what are the, the edges. Uh, so this is the respond to a to a question. 
uh, if you have more questions, let me know. Okay, so uh, so now let's go back to our topic for today. So uh, we are going to talk about coding. Okay. Uh, so there are lots of topics, but uh, I believe most of them are fairly simple. You have known it. Uh, so so I will I'll go through the first point and third point really quick. Uh, probably most of the time will be spent on, on the, the last two or last three. So I don't know whether I have time to talk about this. I didn't upload this part to the notes, but uh, uh, if I have time, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about this. Okay? Okay, so let's, let's start with some simple uh, arithmetic. Okay, so uh, we are going to look at arithmetic means addition, multiplication, but uh, it's circular, it's, uh, it's periodic. So, so we are going to, to see a, a new kind of, or another kind of arithmetic, we call it modular arithmetic. Uh, so it is an arithmetic dealing with periodic computations. Right? So it was first introduced by Gauss, we mentioned his name before, uh, in the 19th century, and it is very similar to the ordinary arithmetic. Uh, okay, so the definition is we have to introduce uh, a relation called a congruence relation between integers. Okay, so the mathematical definition is like this. So suppose A and B are integers such that their difference is a multiple of another integer, uh, a positive integer n. Right? And then we write this, A, it read as A is congruent to B modulo n. Right? This mod is a shorthand for modulo. Okay. Uh, so the meaning is the difference of A and B is a multiple. So uh, the above equation is called a congruence equation, or simply called congruence. So the integer n is called the modulus, the mod modulus. Okay, uh, for example, uh, because we are talking about periodic movements, right? Like every day is it's periodic. So if we use 24 hour clock, and there are two numbers, uh, like one, 13, uh, 125, uh, they are, okay, so they are congruent modulo 24, right? So, so if you have these two numbers, then A and B are the same time, but maybe on different days. Right? So, so now, and 24 hours later, uh, these numbers are congruent to each other. Okay, now if you, if you use 12 hour clock, and then, uh, so like 113, Will be, mod will be congruent modulo 12. So in this case, A and B are the same time, but uh, maybe on different half of the day or, or on the same day or, or different days. Right? Uh, so the one remark is when we talk about congruence, we talk about integers. We don't talk about fractions or, or uh, like root 2. So we only talk about integers. Okay, so then there are some simple properties of uh, congruences. I believe most of you are quite familiar with this. Okay. But let, let's, let's go through it uh, very quickly. So the theorem says if a remainder of A when divided by N is R, and then A is congruent to R modulo N. So uh, the reason is simple because a minus b is uh, a, a minus r is a multiple of n. Okay. So uh, this is clear, right? So the remainder means you can write uh, a as uh, n times q plus r, right? So therefore, uh, it, you, you learn in high school the math mathematics is uh, if you use a to divide n, uh, n to divide a, you get quotient q and remainder r, right? 
So, so if you look at a minus r, this is a multiple of n because it's q times n. So therefore, you have this is a multiple of n. Then, by definition, a and r are congruent modular. So, for example, well, you can see that uh, 322, one divided by three is one. So, so 322 is congruent to one modulo two. Now there are uh, there are other simple observations. So a and b are congruent modulo n if and only if this is a shorthand for if and only if and only if a and b have the same remainder, one divided by n. Okay. So uh, so let's see why this is the case. Suppose the remainder the remainders of a and b one divided by n are r and s respectively. And then both a minus r and b minus s are multiple of n. Uh, we have seen that in the previous slides. Okay. So therefore, the difference a minus r and b minus s are also multiple of n. Right? If you if you have two multiple of n, you you subtract them, they, it is still a multiple of n. But you can change the expression a little bit. You change a minus r minus bracket b minus s into a minus b minus r minus s. So, so this guy is also multiple of n. Therefore, a minus b is multiple of n if and only if r minus s is multiple of n, right? Because the difference is multiple of n. If a minus b is multiple of n, then this guy must be, right? If this guy is like a minus b, they, they, they are all multiple of n. So since r and s both lie between zero and n minus one, so so r minus s is smaller. The absolute value is, is smaller than n. So therefore, the only chance of r minus s is a multiple of n is zero. R minus s is zero. So therefore, uh, if a congruent to b modulo uh, n if and only if, so we trace this, if and only if a minus b is a module of n, then if and only if r minus s is a module of n, and then by the, this paragraph, if and only if r minus s is zero, so r equal s. Okay. So this is again very simple. Uh, you can treat the congruence almost like a equation, equality. So you can multiply uh, a congruence by any integer. For example, uh, you have this uh, congruence, and then you can multiply both sides by five. The result is still a congruence. Okay, so this is a theorem that I, I don't want to prove it. So it's very simple. If I show it, it's extremely easy. Uh, similarly, you can add any integers to the both side of the congruence. Right? For example, okay, so you have 321 congruent to 123 modulo 9. Uh, and then you can add any number. So my favorite number is 7, so you can add 7 on both sides, so you get this. Or you can actually minus, right? you, can, you, can, you can add minus 7, or in other words, you subtract 7 on both sides, and uh, it's still a congruence. So it's simple. Uh, the next fact is you can actually raise both sides of the congruence to the same positive power. Uh, uh, let's see, for example, so here's the reason. So suppose you know A is congruent to, so this is a congruence, right? A congruence to B modulo N. Now I want to convince you that you can raise it to power two, for example. Uh, if you understand you can raise it to power two, the same reason will tell you you can raise it to power three, power four, power five. Okay. So why this is true? So suppose uh, we have a congruence A, okay, A congruence to B modular N. And then we know we can multiply a number. So we multiply A on both sides. So we get A squared is congruent to AB modular N. We can also multiply B on both sides, so we get BA is congruent to B squared modulo N. Therefore, 
Yeah, because AB is BA. So A square and B square are there. They are covered. Right. So, and then if you know, you can do once, you can do it one more time, and then uh, you know you can raise it to any positive power. Okay. Uh, for example, uh, let's, uh, we have this congruence, 321, it's congruent to 6 modulo 9. Now you can square both sides, so you get this. Okay. Uh, I don't want to read this. Okay. So then, or you can cube both sides, so you get this congruence. Okay, so the congruence is behaves very similar to, to equality. Okay, it's just uh, okay, maybe in the previous slides I already used this property. Nobody stand up and protest, so I guess you know. Uh, so the congruence actually have this so called transitive property. The meaning of transitive is this. If A is congruent to B modulo N and B is congruent to C modulo N, then A is congruent to C modulo N. So this is again fairly natural. Uh, well, when you deal with congruence, you have to be careful. So all these properties, the, the N must be the, the same. If you change N, then it's a different story. Uh, okay, so let's see the transitivity. So suppose we have this number is congruent to 36 modulo 9, but we know 36 is congruent to 0 mod modulo 9, right, because both are multiples of 9. So it follows by transitivity that this big number is congruent to 0 modulo 9. Okay. Okay, more properties. So you can add both sides, you can multiply both sides. Okay, so two congruence with the same modulus may be added to each other or multiplied one by another, right? In other words, if A is congruent to B modulo N and C is congruent to D modulo N. So we have two, we call it congruence equations, right? It is like an equation. And then you can manipulate the equation by add them up or multiply. So, so if you have these two congruences, and then you know that A plus C is congruent to B plus D modulo N, and A times C is congruent to B times D modulo N. Uh, this is just an example of that. Okay, so suppose you know so this is A, this is B, this is C, this is D. They all congruent modulo 7. Then you can add left hand side and right hand side. And you can multiply left hand side and right hand side. And then get a, a, an easy solution. Right? So, what? Uh, yes, right? Because, uh, so, uh, let me see. I don't have so the question was, uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll say the congruence also have this relation, uh, this property. If A is congruent to B modulo, modulo N, then uh, you can write B is congruent to A modulo N. Uh, you agree with me, right? So, so in other words, congruence is symmetric. Uh, so this is, this is the reason is because if a minus b is a multiple of n, then b minus a is a negative multiple. Of n. So so it's a still multiple. Of n. So therefore, the, the relation holds. Okay. So now his question was, can I can I add a to d, b to c? Well. Now, let's do it here. Now, suppose A is congruent to B. Uh, I drop the mod N, you know. Uh, and uh, C is congruent to B. So from this side, by symmetry, I can get B is congruent to C, right? Because C is congruent to D implies D is congruent to C. So now I can add. 
I, I can add A plus D will be congruent to D plus C. Right, so this is left to left, uh, right to right. So your question is correct. Uh, is it any 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 other comments? Uh, okay, his question is from A congruent to B and C congruent to D. Can we get A plus D is congruent to B plus C? Uh, the answer is yes. The reason is. Uh, you can just flip the second congruence and add. Okay. Uh, okay, so so let me know if you have a question. Okay, so uh, example. Uh, so during a period of 50 days, you put the following amount of money into your PT bank. Uh, this is it, it's not very realistic, but uh, okay. So day one you put one cent. Day two, you put two cents. Day three, you put four cents. You do this geometric. Uh, you every every day you double the previous day. You put so on day k, you put the two to the k minus one cents. Okay. Suppose you are able to do that for fifty days. So finally, you exchange your total amount for dollar notes. So the question is, how many cents will be left over? Uh, you do this for 50 days, you get lots of coins, and then you send the coins, you bring the coins to the bank, the bank gives you bills, and then there are some leftover of coins. So you need to calculate how many coins, uh, how many cents will, will, will be left over. Okay, so here's a solution. Well, first you need to know what is the total amount of your, your coins. So what the total amount in cents will be the geometric series. Uh, we know how to add, right? So this is week one, first, first, first lecture. We, we know how to do this. So we add it. So it's two to the fifty minus one. So let's continue. So we need to find the remainder of two to the fifty minus one, one divided by one hundred, right? Because the oh, in Singapore there's. Singapore, there's no dollar notes. Right? The dollar is also a coin. Well, let's assume you have a, a dollar note. Right? So, okay, so so then uh, you need to find the remainder of this amount divided by uh, 100 because 100 cents is a dollar. Uh, so, uh, so now we try to do some arithmetic. So, what is 2 to the power of 50? So it's okay, the property of uh, the power. So this is 2 to the 10 times 2 to the 10, five times. But 2 to the 10 is 124, right? especially for computer science people. They, they know this by heart. Okay, so 2 to the 10 is this. So it is 124 multiply itself five times. And then you can uh, calculate, uh, or you can just observe. 1,024 1, is congruent to 24 modulo 100. Right? So therefore, uh, here's the property of the congruence. So the product of these is, since 1,024, 1, is congruent to 24 modulo 100. So therefore, five copies of 1024 is congruent to five copies of 24 multiplied together, right? So this is the property we use. So this is 24 to the power of five, but then you can easily calculate this congruent to 24 modulo 100. So therefore, the, the amount we are interested in is this number minus one. So this is 23. So you have 23 cents left. Okay. So that's a, that's an example. Now, uh, we can use modular arithmetic to, to do something else. Uh, again, this is a well-known fact, probably you know it in elementary school. So we want to look at the congruence modulo nine. 
Okay. So the question is, for example, people ask you uh, uh, some very, very large number or a relatively large number, something like this. Is this guy divisible by nine? Right? So is there, other than just divide, do you have a shortcut? Well, the answer is yes. So you can do something like this. So you see the one, two, one, two, three, four, six is one times 10 to the power of four and so on and so forth, right? So it's and two times uh, 1,000 plus three times 100 plus four times 10 plus six. So when you, module, when you do the modular arithmetic, uh, 10 modulo, 10 is congruence, congruence to one modulo nine. Right? So 10. Right? So therefore, you can safely replace the 10 by one uh, and write a, a congruence here. So if you have a one here, this is one. One times one is still one. No matter how many power you raise, it's still one. So it's congruent to one plus two plus three plus four plus six. So this is uh, seven, uh, uh, congruent to seven modulo nine, right? So the answer is no, because seven, nine does not uh, divide seven. So, so. So the so this guy is not divisible by that. Uh, is this is it quite quite obvious? So this example tell us the a general theorem. So the theorem says let S be the sum of the digits of a decimal representation. We are going to look at decimal representation uh, one more time later. Decimal representation of a of the positive integer n, then actually n and this sum is congruent modulo nine. So the conclusion, the corollary is n is divisible by nine. If and only if it's if you add the the, the digits up, the, the the sum is divisible by nine. Right. The earlier example just showed that. If you want to know whether this guy is divisible by nine or not, you just add the single digit up. So you get this, and the, then you look at whether seven is divisible by nine. And so, so this is the the, the theorem says. Now the proof is is exactly the same. Actually, okay. So, so first part B follows from part A because uh, if n is divisible by nine, and then the uh, n is congruent to zero modulo nine, right? So, so, so n is divisible by nine if and only if n is congruent to zero modulo. So we, we just use this as uh, as a bridge. If and only if uh, n is uh, congruent to zero modulo nine. So and this side is if and only if S is congruent to zero modulo nine. So therefore, if N is congruent to S modulo nine, one side congruent to zero, the other side must congruent to zero. So therefore, one side is divisible by nine, if and only if the other side is divisible by nine. So, so this B follows A. Very, 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 uh, very easy. Okay, now let's look at the the proof of A. So let n be uh, a k a k minus one dot dot a zero be a decimal representation of the integer n. So so it's like one two three four six or right, something like this. So actually n is equal to this, right? So the the k digit you multiply by 10 to the k because it's, it's decimal representation. And plus a k, a k minus 1 times 10 to the k minus 1 and so on and so forth. Now we use, okay, so he, he used this. He used, uh, you can write 10 to the i by uh, 9999 plus 1. Uh, 
or you can use the fact that I just call uh, 10 is congruent to 1 modulo 9, no matter what power you raise, is, is also congruent to 1 modulo 9. Okay. So you, you can use his trick. So this is from textbook. So uh, replace 10 to the i by this. So you get n is 8k times k copy, okay, k consecutive lines plus 1, and plus so on so forth. Right. Now, <coughs> um, you multiply 8k inside, so you get 8k times the bunch of lines plus 8k minus 1 times bunch of lines, and so on and so forth. And then 8k times 1 is here, right? 8k sub a sub k minus 1 is here, and so on and so forth. So, so this is the first bunch of terms plus s. s is the, the sum of the single digits. Okay. So therefore, n minus s is this guy. But this guy is module 9. It's, a, it's divisible by 9, so, so therefore, uh, a is congruent to s module 9. Uh, actually, I think the proof can be much simpler. Is. Okay, so uh, so, so we look at some simple examples, right? So we ask, like, is this guy? How about just now we see one, two, three, four, six, right? Now let's say one, two, three, four, five, six. Is this guy divisible at nine? Or we can ask a little bit more. What was okay? So from one to eight, is this digit? Is, is this? number divisible by 9. Well, uh, by the theorem, we just look at the sum of these numbers, with these digits. So for the first, in, the, in the first case, the sum is 21. It's not divisible by 9. So the, this number is not, not divisible by 9. For the second one, if you add them up, you get 36. So it is, it is divisible by 9. So therefore, uh, the original number is whatever it is, is also divisible by that. Right, so this is, I'm sure you know this. Right? Okay, now, is it useful? Uh, okay, maybe uh, it's, it's useful. For example, here is, is one of the applications. So, sometimes you want to check uh, whether some arithmetic you have done is true or false. Uh, so, so, you can try this, right? So, suppose A times B is C. And then you can use 9 to divide. Uh, okay. Then you look at A, you can add everything. Add all the digits in A. You add them up, you get S. You add all the digits in B, you get T. You add all the digits in C, you get U. So by the property we just learned, if A times B is C, and then uh, S times T must be congruent to U modulo 9. Okay. So we want to use this property to help us check. Uh, maybe there's some mistakes or, or uh, so for example, like this. Suppose some, somebody give you uh, equation like this number times whatever it is equal this number. Now you want to see whether it's, uh, it's right or not. You want to do a quick check, right? You don't want to really multiply the right? So you can use this property. So you add this number up. You get 5 plus 3 plus 1 plus 8 um, times the sum of all these, right? Then you check this number, whether this number is congruent to the sum of all the digits in, on the right hand side. So now in this example, somehow the textbook work out. Uh, no, it's, uh, uh, it doesn't doesn't work out. So so therefore there's a mistake. But I guess nowadays uh, people have calculated or whatever computers. People don't care about this. Anyway, so this is just a, some artificial. Now, uh, so that's the quick uh, uh, 
is a revision of multiple asymmetric. So now, from this slide onwards, uh, this is a proper topic about coding. So uh, first, we have to see the uh, problem of, of coding. So what are the the okay, so what is coding theory about? So just now there are six items. Right, okay, so, so let's quickly go through it. Then I'll, I'll go back to the diagram. The diagram is much easier to see. So we, we are talking about how to transfer some information. So we have several ingredients, several parts in this process. So the first part is information source. Right? So the messages or information is to be sent. And then we have to encode this. Right, so we, we convert this into digits or something else. And then we, we have some channel to send this information through. So the signals is sent through a channel. Actually, it's just a sent by some machine. Uh, for example, a computer. Uh, in the textbook, it also lists like facts, like, uh, but nowadays, I guess, people seldom use facts. Uh, okay. So uh, in the process, Maybe there are some noise or errors. For example, uh, there's some distortion, like if there's lightning and then somehow the, the, the signal is corrupt. Right? Or there's you know, copy it down uh, wrongly, or the machine has some part defect, right? so it doesn't produce the correct uh, information. So, so it could have some, some noise. And then after the other party received the signal, so they have to recover, right? they have to restore the original signal from, from whatever they received. Now, because of part four, they could receive something, something uh, with errors, right? So they have to, they have to try to detect them and probably try to correct them. Okay. So uh, in the end, after you do the decoding, you get the final outcome. Okay. So uh, so this is a picture. So you send information from one, from the source to the sink. Right? So you, you try to go through this. Now the coding theory is about this part. So you have to do something to, to have to do some coding to turn this information into, let's say, digital form, okay? Now, and then uh, you, you, you use computer or use fax or use whatever to, to send to another party. In between, there could be some noise, right? So, for example, here, there's something broken. Or you could, could add some noise to the, to, the, to the signals. And then this side, you have to de decode. In the end, you get the information. So now why, okay, so what is important about this? So in the next hour, I will try to introduce some algorithm so that the, with some encoding, it can prevent, so even you have some, some uh, uh, noise, even you have some errors, the other party have a way to to read off the correct information. So the coding part is we have to find some clever way so that the other party, when they receive the the the, 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 the message, they are able to decode the correct information. Okay. So we have to find a way so that to anticipate some noise. Okay, okay so, uh, so this part is to say that we can represent uh, arbitrary message by digits. Again, I think uh, when the textbook was written, it's still uh, maybe 10 years ago, it, now it seems too old. Right? 
So now I think it's quite clear that everything can be digitized. Uh, if you have a picture, you have a movie, you, you, you don't look at analog, you don't, have, you don't look at chemicals, you look at digital products, right? So, but, okay, so let's quickly go through this. So uh, we can represent many things, okay. So first, most of electronic devices can, can be in one of the two states, right? For example, it's, it's on or off, and so it's convenient to represent the two states by zero and one. Now suppose you have many things you want to code, right? you want to represent, you want to, we can use two bits to represent four states, right? right? So you can think of these as one state, zero, zero, one state, zero, one, another state, so here you can have four states. Uh, in general, you can, you can use uh, k bits to represent two to the k in the states. So, so you can use zero, one to represent whatever things you want to represent as long as you have enough, uh, enough lens. Okay, so uh, we have seen decimal system. So I I historically, uh, counting is usually done in group of tens. Uh, they say probably because they have 10 fingers. So when you learn counting, you use your fingers. I suppose we are like in the cartoon, everybody have four fingers and probably you look at Modulo eight, but anyway. So, so we are doing things in, in, in base ten. So we have ten digits from zero to nine. Okay. Uh, for example, as you have seen this before, right? So, so this two thousand nineteen is two times one thousand plus okay zero times one hundred and so on. Okay. So this is the decimal uh, way to represent this thing. Now we want to use binary system. We have to write uh, a digit using zero or one. Okay. So there's a way of doing that. Uh, so here's the algorithm. Right? So suppose I give you n in decimal form, like 2019. Right? And I want you to convert the 2019 or this capital N in binary. So here's the algorithm. So you divide the number n in decimal by two repeatedly to get all possible successive remainders. Let's, let's assume you first time you divide, you get remainder R1, second time R2, and in the end you get Rk. So the result, okay, so, so in other words, uh, so the n is Rk times two to the uh, K minus one plus dot 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 plus R one times uh, one. Okay, and then the binary representation of this positive number n is just this. Right? It's just R K and then you get that. It's R K followed by R K minus one and, and R two and R one. The bracket, the subscript two is to emphasize the so-called base of the representation is two. Uh, so it may be omitted if there's no ambiguity. Okay, so, so when in doubt, we just write it. Um, each of the digits in the binary representation is called a bit. Um, well, this looks uh, abstract, right? Look at example. So here's my capital N, two, three, five. I want to write this into binary. Okay. So the algorithm says we have to repeatedly divide. Okay. Divide the number by two repeatedly to get the, the sequence, the successive remainder. Okay, so divide. So this is a quotient, this is remainder. And then repeatedly, so then you divide the quotient, use two, and then you get new quotient, new divider. Right, then do it, keep doing it until you get zero. Right, so this is the part. Divide the number n by two repeatedly to get all possi possible successor successive remainders, R1 to Rk. Okay. So you get these. And then the binary representation is just to write these things in backwards, in, in this order. Okay. So you, you, you divide. Right. 
you get first one, first remainder R1, second R2, dot 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 RK. Now the correct binary representation is you write them backwards. You write RK first, and then RK minus one, and so on, and then the last one is R1. So example, so here you divide, this is R1, this is R2, R3, R4, so on and so forth. Now the binary representation is to write, okay, start from here, one, 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 zero, one, zero, one, zero, one, one. Okay, so that's the obvious. Well, there are some, uh, okay, there's something about bar gua or whatever. It's not very interesting. Okay, so so now we are with, with the when we talk about digital files, we can we can talk about the mathematics behind coding. Right? Okay, so we are interested in error detecting code. Okay, so the errors, as 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 we said in, in step four, right, of the transmission, can occur in the transmitted code. Right? For example, so if we send this one 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 the receiving end may get one one, maybe this guy is corrupt, right? So you get one one zero one one, okay? So if error occurs only at a few bits, can we detect them? So this is assumed that, remember that there are possible some noise, right? Hopefully the noise is not too big. If, if the noise is too big, then there's no hope. But let's assume the noise was like caused by lightning, it is very rare, right? So, so you only see one or two mistakes, then there's a way to calculate. It. Okay, so, so some common errors in writing, uh, uh, in writing a number of sequence are uh, you mess up, you interchange two adjacent digits. For example, uh, so this is called tr transposition error. So uh, we'll, we'll see it uh, uh, many times later. Uh, the other one is you make a single error, uh, making an error in one digit. This is an example of making a single error. Right? Uh, the meaning is obvious. There's one digit gone, so it's a single error. The transposition is, uh, suppose you send AB, you receive BA. Uh, when you copy it, somehow you copy wrongly, so, so that's transposition. Okay, so uh, now here, uh, this is the idea behind the the coding. Okay. So have you ever wondered why there's a letter at the end of many things? Right. For example, car registration number. Uh, so that you have this H somewhere, and then in a, in your IC you have a, a bunch of number followed by some some letter. Right. So what is the purpose? So these letters can detect simple errors in writing the numbers and can prevent forgery. Right. So, so, the, so the, the message is this. So the idea is we are going to pre, uh, we are going to code the information with some redundancy. Well, for example, I think this example is more is clear. So suppose I want to send uh, I want to send this state someone, right? So I add Monday. So so I send two two chunk of information. One is Monday, the other one is this date. Uh, okay. So now the 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 first part of the first chunk of information, for example Monday, can also serve as a check symbol, right? For instance, uh, because here you may have ambiguity. You don't know whether it's October 1st or January 10th, right? But with the, the, this extra chunk, you know that this cannot be January 10th because you can check that this is a, a Wednesday. So therefore, with a little bit more extra information, you can get rid of some errors or ambiguity. Right. So, so that's the idea. So, in order to to uh, 
to prevent simple errors, we pay the price to send a little bit longer uh, code. And then somehow it helped us. So the, the issue was, can you design some safe method? So it's guaranteed to, to, to correct some mistakes, and also the price you pay is as, as, as low as possible. Right? You don't want to copy it every word 1,000 times. Right? So, uh, so can you do it efficiently, and can you prove the correctness? Okay, okay so we are going to see some method. Uh, so here, uh, we are going to look at the first coding method. This is very simple, very natural. Okay, so first, uh, suppose on your keyboard you only have these, right? So you want to code uh, s sequence of symbols so that symbols only contains uh, letters, blank space, and digits. Right? In other words, it only has symbols from zero to nine and from A to Z with actual blank. Okay, so now uh, we first turn everything into numbers. Right? Here you have blank, you have letter, you have digit. So we change everything, we turn everything to, into numbers. So if it's already a number, we, we keep it. If it's A, we just write 10. Right? We already use 9, so we have 10, and B is 11, and so on and so forth. And Z turns out to be 35, the blank will be the 36. We'll use 36 to, to represent blank. So, uh, but blank is too long to type, so very often I'll just write the underscore uh, as blank. Okay, so uh, the coding will be done using this weighted sum. Okay, let's see. So given a sequence of, or a sequence, sometimes we call the sequence words of this, like Sn, Sn minus one, dot, 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 S1, is weighted sum is the sum of this form. So there are n symbols. You use n to multiply the first symbol, the Sn. N minus one multiply this Sn minus one. And use one to, mul uh, to multiply the last one. So, so the, the EI is a numerical value corresponding to the table. Uh, let's look at an example. So the example is, so we want to find the weighted sum of this sequence. No, followed by a space, followed by food. Okay, so this is a word or a sequence of length seven. Okay, so we want to turn this into a weight, find its weighted sum. So the solution is, First, we find the numerical value of these symbols. So n is 23, uh, uh, and no blank is 36, right? So this guy is 36, and so on so forth. O is 24. And so the weighted sum is 7 times the, the corresponding value for n, which is 23. 7 times 23, plus 6 times the, this, this symbol. This because he's at the position 6. So six times 24, plus five times this blank, and so on and so forth. So you get 678. Uh, so this is our first encoding method. Okay, so we, we encode a sequence of symbols by, by the weighted sum and adding a checking bit C. So let's see. So I'm going to describe a procedure which will encode uh, a string, a word, uh, so that the receiving end somehow can see whether it has a, a, an error or not. Okay. So the the algorithm is goes like this. So the input is a sequence. It's a sequence of of uh, uh, of, of digits or uh, symbols. So first, we have to find, we, have to, we want to add a checking bit. So we, we want to find the checking bit C in this way. 
So we look at the the, the value, the, the, the weighted value, weighted sum of this sequence. So the EI is the the, the numerical value for the symbol SI. So we have uh, from SN to S2. So we have EN to E2. The C is what we have. Okay, so we find weighted sum. And so the, we add the C so that the total the weighted sum is congruent to zero modulo 27. So that's why we remind you, I remind you the, the congruence relation because we need, we need this. Okay, so then you solve the C, you'll find the symbol S1 that corresponding to C, right? So the output of the encoded sequence is whatever the original you have together with an extra digit, S1, which corresponding to the checking digit. Uh, well, there's a small remark saying 37 can be replaced by any large prime, but we don't care. We just we just use 37 in this in this hour. Uh So let's see some examples, uh, and then we can take a break. Okay, we want to encode the the word A6 blank seven uh, using this modulo 27 method. Okay, so. The algorithm goes like this. So first, you think of everything as a digit. Right? A is 10, uh, 6 is 6, the blank is 36, 7 is 7. So now we first calculate to find this uh, check digit C. So how to find this? We have a congruence equation. So so the weighted sum will be 5, so you have, you have 4 here. You, are, you want to add a C as the last last digit, so you have five. So so it's five times the value of A, which is ten, plus four times six, plus three times the value of blank, plus two times seven, plus one times the unknown C. Now you want this number congruent to zero modulo thirty-seven. So you get an equation about C, and then you can solve C. Turns out C is 26. So you look at the table again. So 26 corresponding to Q. So the encoded sequence is the four digits you have together with this checking digit, C. C is Q. We send this. Uh, well, okay, so, so let's take a break. Of the break, I'll, I'll explain what is the use for this checking bit? How does it help us? Okay, so let's take a break. Okay, so, uh, yeah, thanks for the feedback. Uh, uh, okay, so let's, let's continue. So, uh, what is the purpose of adding this actual bit? Right. So, the purpose is <coughs> so if A is a correctly encoded word, and then, so let's, let's make some operations. Right? So, then the weighted sum is congruent to 0 modulo 37. Right? Because this is because we add the actual bit C to make it happen. Right. So therefore, if, if this is correctly encoded word, then the weighted sum is congruent to zero modulo uh, 37. So therefore, if uh, if you see, so this is a contrapositive of this. Right? So if you, you, you see the weighted sum is not congruent to zero modulo 37, and then it must have some something wrong. Because the correct guys will be covered to zero. Right? So if you if you receive a message, it turns out to be 
not congruent to zero modulo 37, and then something's wrong. <coughs> but however, okay, don't make this converse error or whatever. So <coughs> uh, suppose that the, the, the weighted sum is, is congruent to zero modulo 37, it could contain mistakes, maybe contain just too many mistakes and somehow it even balanced out and it, it's possible. Okay, so so in that case, the errors are not detected. Okay. So let's let's see, let's look at some examples, right? So suppose the suppose we send this work, right? Just now we, we in the previous slides we did some work. We find the extra bit is Q. So suppose we send this to another party to some NTU, and then they receive the, there's one error inside. For example, the A somehow turns out to be C when they receive. So they receive C six blank seven Q. Right? So then you see the error is detected because if you calculate the weighted sum, uh, it turns out to be so this is twenty six. So C C should be uh, this is a code for Q twenty six. So if you calculate it's not congruent to zero. So in other words, you can detect a single error. Okay. So, so this is the this is the reason we are doing this uh, encoding modulo thirty-seven. So theorem says, in a weighted sum encoding modulo thirty-seven, in this procedure, if a single error occurs, suppose you 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 only have one one bit change, then it can be detected. Uh, so the reason, okay, so let's see the proof. Uh, so suppose uh, capital A is this word, as n dot 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 s1 is the correct word, right? Now a single error occurs at some position, say position i, right? So so you change the correct digit s i to some garbage at x. So the word a will become a prime. So then the difference of the weighted sum of a and weighted sum of a prime will be this, because we use i to multiply the i's digit, right? So the, the, the weight of i's digit. So it is i times si minus i times x. All others are canceled. You only have this, this remains. So this i times the weight of SI minus the, the, the weight of the, the garbage. Okay. Now, since both factor I and the bracket SI minus X, they are between 0 and 37. Right? They are. Okay. So the product cannot be a multiple of 37. This, this is because 37 is a prime. So the product it cannot be a multiple of 37. So therefore, the difference is not congruent to to zero modulo 37. But we know the weighted sum of a a is correct. A is correct word is congruent to zero modulo 37. So therefore, this guy, the garbage, the the guy containing the garbage, is not uh, congruent to zero, right? So the error you can detect. Uh, again, notice here we only use 37 as a prime. You can replace 37 by by any larger, sufficient large prime. Uh, now, how about uh, another common errors? So, which is called a transposition error. So let's look at the example. So suppose an encoded word is W, X, Y, Z, right? Where X is different from Y and Z is a, a, a check symbol. Suppose you, you have this, this word. Now, and if the received word is W, Y, X, Z, in other words, if you see a transposition error, so transposition error means 
two two letters are small. So when you send W X Y Z, you receive W Y X Z. And suppose this happened. Now we want to see the error really can be detected. Right. Okay, so is the, the example clear? So I want to show you in this case it can be detected. Okay, so the, the, the proof is this, right? So let A be the encoded word W, X, Y, Z, and B is the one you receive, W, Y, X, which contains a transposition error. Let W of A and W of B denote their respective weighted sum. Okay? So the error can be detected if the weighted sum of B is not congruent to zero, as we, we showed before. So to de detect error means we check the sum, hopefully it's, it's not uh, congruent to zero. So is it true? Okay, let's try. So the weighted sum of A is this, because this is minus four. So you use four to turn the, the force, uh, S4, plus three times S3, which is X, and so on and so forth. Okay. Now WB is, again, four times W, but the third digit is Y, so you use three times Y, so you get this, okay? So WB minus WA is Y minus X. Now, WA is a correct word, so the weighted sum of A, so A is correct word, so the weighted sum of A is coming to zero modulo 37. Okay. So therefore, the weighted sum of B is congruent to y minus x modulo 37, but y minus x is co not congruent to zero because there are digits between, uh, how to say, these are numbers between uh, zero and 37. So you cannot be uh, divisible by, it's not a multiple of, of 37. Right? For example, y is 26, uh, X is 5, so you get 21. So 21 is, is smaller than 37, so, so it cannot be a multiple of 37. Right? So therefore, we can detect this error. Okay. So this example shows uh, the weighted sum modulo 37 can detect a transposition error. So in short, we, uh, we have seen an algorithm which just add a checking bit the advantage of this algorithm is it can detect a single error. It also can detect a transposition error. But we know that these two errors are the most common errors in transmission. So this method can help us to detect whether there's an error. Okay? So, so this is the first algorithm. Now, uh, we are going to to look at some real life uh, applications, right? So uh, the application one is this ISBN, is this international standard book number, which appear in uh, uh, every book. So uh, in the past, before 2007, the number is 10 digits, but now it's probably 13 digits, maybe, maybe even more. So now it's longer. So we, uh, well, for this general education module, we, we consider the old 10-digit uh, long ISBN number. Okay. So the example is this. So on the back of the book, you see something like ISBN, which is something like this. Okay. So the digits are arranged in, in four groups, which are sometimes separated by a, a hyphen. So the group has some meaning originally. Right, so it's a, there are some geographic grouping, so it's US or Europe, or, or, and the publisher code, and then the book code, and the checking digit. So this guy is checking digit. So, so you have some number like this. So the checking digit is chosen so that the weighted sum of all 10 digits is a multiple of 11. So again, we choose a prime number, which is 
long enough because we call 10 digits, so we have 11. So the checking di digit could be uh, 0, 1, 2, all the way to 9, and 10. 10 is, we use x to represent 10. So, so the checking digit could be one out of these 11 choices. So for example, let's look at one ISBN number. So this is a 10 digit thing. So the, the hyphen are of no importance. It's just randomly put there. It's, it's not uh, important. So in this case, <coughs> it's, okay, it's, it's likely that zero stands for the country, is, uh, so maybe US. And then 13, <coughs> the next two digits, is uh, the publishers. Uh, so maybe 13 would be the some publisher, like I know, Cambridge. Uh, <coughs> then this six digits is the code for the book. Right? And the last one, the number four, is a checking digit. Okay, so, <coughs> so, so look at examples. Is this number, is this word, uh, the 10, 10 digits word, a proper uh, ISBN number. Okay. So let's, let's, let's see. Let's look at the weighted sum. So if it's a multiple 11, then this is a proper uh, ISBN. Otherwise, it's not. OK, so x is 10, right? So you calculate the weighted sum. So it's 10 times the first digit plus 9 times the second digit and 8 I mean, from from the from left to right. So actually, this is a tenth position. Right? It's ten times s ten plus nine times s nine, which is one, and so on and so forth. So the last one is one times the s one, but s one is x, which is ten. So it's one times ten. So if you add things up, you get one hundred thirty-two. It's a multiple eleven. So this is a ISBN. It's a proper ISBN. Uh, now, what happened? Okay, suppose you have an error, right? Suppose the ISBN, this this thing, is copied incorrectly with the digit six, uh, this digit replaced by nine. Let's see how does this affect the weighted sum, right? So, so we want to see that uh, if you make a single error whether we can detect it. OK, so let's try. So it's an incorrect. If you copy this word wrongly, the 6 will be become 9. It's like this. So the weighted sum is, OK, do the same business. So 10 times S10 is 1, plus 9 times S9, which is 8, and so on and so forth. So last one is 1 times x. x is 10. 1 times 10. And somehow you get this number, uh, 307. It's not a multiple of 11, so there must be an error. Right? So with the checking bit, it helps us to detect the errors. Um, you may ask, why 11, not 10? The, the answer is because 11 is a prime, and <coughs> 10 doesn't work. Because for 10, you could have two smaller numbers. The product is 10. 11, you cannot have. So, so the answer was, if 10 is used, then some simple error may not be detected. So uh, actually, the textbook gave an example. So for example, let's, for, 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 for one minute, we use, we encode modulo 10 instead of 11. Let's see how, where does it go wrong. OK, so suppose we want to uh, encode this word, right, modulo 10. OK, so then uh, we see, suppose there is a single error. We, let's see whether we can detect it. OK, so we want to do two things. We have a word. We want to encode it modulo 10. Okay, fine. You can do it. Right? After that, 
we create an error and demonstrate if you use module 10, you cannot detect that error. So module 10 doesn't work. Okay, so let's try. So first, we, we find the checking bit C. So this is just calculate the weighted sum, and somehow, in the calculation, you use mod 10 instead of mod 11. So you use this, you get the equation, and you get C equal 4. Okay, so C is 4. So the incorrect uh, ISBN is this. So the originally, the correct word start with a 1, right? So the error occurs, the 1 is wrongly copied as 5. So the, the incorrect SBA is this. So the coding bit is still 4, but the first one was copied wrongly as 5. Now, what is the weighted sum now? So again, it's uh, 10 times the, the value 5, and so on and so forth. And even with this error, it's still a module of 10. Right? So, so that, that says we cannot do that. We cannot choose 10 as, as the, uh, in, for, for encoding. Right? So the... <coughs> So therefore, if you use modulo 10, it doesn't help. So therefore, we don't use modulo 10. We use 11. Uh, and uh, as I said before, you can use larger prime numbers. It's fine. But prime is more. OK, so uh, what are the properties? So why the publishers use SBA? So because. Uh, as we observed before, the two most common errors in handling uh, a word or whatever uh, is a single error or a transposition error. The claim is uh, ISBN can detect these errors. So the reason is exactly the same as the, the argument for modulo 37. Right? It's just replace 37 by 11. Uh, all the property you use is, is is a prime number. Now, the same reason, 11 is also a prime number. Whatever your reason is for 37, is still applied for, for 11. So therefore, uh, I do not repeat this. So if we can detect a single error, we can detect a transposition error. Uh, what we can't do, right? So it is possible for other type of error, such that if you have two errors, or uh, you have uh, right, if you have if you alter two digits, not consecutive or, uh, or you have too many errors like you, you, okay, so you, you can cook some examples so that uh, even you use modulo 11, it doesn't work. So, so this is the summary of this ISP. Now, good, so I still have time to, to talk about this. This is more interesting. I think this is more interesting than ISP. Okay, so earlier we saw that uh, the checking digit can be used to detect errors. So if I receive a code, a, a word, I can calculate weighted sum. Somehow I know whether there's an error or not. Error. But I don't know what the error is. I only know that there, 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 it contains an error. But where, where, where exactly is that? Okay, so very often it is desirable to not only detect errors, but also to pinpoint, pinpoint the error and correct it, right? So I want to know what is the correct message. And not only I know whether I received the correct thing you sent me, also I want to know in case there is an error, I want to recover the original message. So assuming not too many errors occur, 
is it is possible. So the next topic is called uh, the use the Hamming code. How many of you have seen this video? All the computer scientists are angry. But anyway, so since I, I I didn't know it before, so I okay, so uh, so let's go through. So today I think I'll cover this hopefully. Uh, yes, I will upload it uh, uh, later. I I didn't okay. I didn't upload because I look at the number of slides uh, is enough to cover today's lecture. But uh, now I still have seven minutes, so I believe within seven minutes is enough. This is so simple. It's very nice and at the same time it's so simple that you can see, you can understand it uh, very, very easy, very, very quickly. Okay, so I'm going to talk about Hamming code. So here's the person who invented code. So he's an American mathematician and probably engineer or com computer, science, computer scientist. So uh, it was discovered in 1948 while he was at Bell Labs. Uh, okay, so what is Hamming bracket seven four codes? So the four is the, the information you want to send. So you encode four bits. The bit is zero one, the binary, binary sense, uh, of data into seven bits by adding three parity bits. So we are we pay the price by adding three digits, and so that we know <laughs> we can correct a simple error. Right? So the the price to pay is you make the war longer. Uh, in the previous slides, we add one bit so that we can detect whether there's transmission error. Now we add three digits out of four. I mean, if I want to send a word of length four. I add three more things. And then we can not only detect the transmission error, we can also correct it uh, if the error was small. OK, anyway. So we can detect and correct any single bit error. Okay. And we can detect, but not correct uh, two bit error. Okay. So let's see how it, it was done. So, 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 so here's the construction. So the input is we understand four digits, right? Four bits, S1, S2, S3, S4. So the output will be a code, H, for hanging. Uh, not only you have whatever you have here, W, you add three extra bits, S5, S6, S7, where these three red, the things you add, are called parity check bits, parity bits. Define as follows. Okay, so it satisfies some congruence relations. It looks horrible. Uh, okay, so how do I? Okay. But with this graph, it's very easy to to remember. Okay, so here is the. <coughs> so either you you like equations, you can use this, or you can use this graph. So the graph is simple. So you write the draw three circles. And then you write your S1, S2, S3, S4. Must be in this order. So S1 is in the middle. And then you go to right. You write S2, left, S3, top, S4. And then again, S5, S6, S7 also follow this order. S5 is here. S6 is there. S7 is here. So A, B, C. So follow that. OK? Now, what are these three equations? It says <coughs> the you look at the circle A, the total number you when you add them up must be even. So the total number of ones in each of the circle A, B, C must be even. So if you add them up, these four letters is not add them up. You can count the number of ones in, in A must be even. The total number of ones in B must be even. Total number in C must be even. Right, so this is a picture version of these things are modulo, and when you add them up, it's congruent to zero modulo two. It's a fancy way of saying this is a even. Okay, 
example. So we want to find uh, the Hamming code for this, 0, 1, 0, 0. Okay, we write it in this order, right? 0, then down to right 1, and 0, and 0, right? 0, 1, 0, 0. And then we have to add the three red digits. So S5 is added so that in the circle A, the total number one must be even. These three zeros uh, in circle A are in circle A. So you can't write this as one. If you write, if you choose this as one, it, it, it fails. So you have to write, you have to choose this S5 to be zero. So that in the circle A, the total number of ones are are uh, even, like zero is a even number. Now, how about in circle B? You see zero, zero, one, right? And then this, this has to be one, because if you choose zero, the total number of ones in B is one. That, that is not what we want. So we want the total number of ones in B even. So you have to have one here. The same for C. So therefore, you have to add. 0, 1, 1 as the suffix, as the tag. So the, the, the code word is, you have the four digit 0, 1, 0, 0, followed by 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. Okay, so that's the, the message. Okay, extremely simple, right? So property, so why, why does it work? So the theorem says this code can detect a one bit error. Okay, so so the reason is okay. Suppose uh, the Hamming seven four code word was sent and it is one C, one one error. Suppose it contains one error, and then the single bit error can be detected and corrected based on the, the parity check. Right. So for example, uh, okay. so how do we know which one? Which one is wrong? So you look at the 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 parity check in A, in B, and in C. Suppose all of them are wrong, right? all fails. So if if you add the number of ones in A is odd, in B is odd, in C is odd, then you only have one source to make three errors. The only culprit is the guy in the intersection of the three, which is S1. Right? Now, if you you calculate that if you do the parity check, A pass, B and C fail, then the culprit must be the guy who is only in B and C. Right? That's the guy. That's the guy. Right? This is the, the same. So suppose you, you only, only A fail, B and C pass, and then it must because of the guy who only living in A, right? It has nothing to do with, with B and C. So, so it has to be S5, right? So, so th these are the typical examples. The real proof is this. So you can check, you can exhaust all possibilities. If O fails, is S1. If B C fails, is the, the the guy who lives only in B and C. If uh, if AC fails, only AC fails, then it's the guy who only lives inside A and C, which is S3, and so on and so forth. Right? So you can check. Right? So you can detect all of them. So you can and you can correct because if if S1 is wrong, is is can only change from zero to one or one to zero. So so you know how to correct. Okay. So so this is the 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 theorem. Now, uh, oh, so you have to tolerate me. Please, Let, let's go through the simple example. So, assume there's only one error. Let's uh, find the original code word. So, let's do one of them. Uh, I think so. So, let's let's do B for example. So, I draw my favorite three circle. So, uh, in B, I receive. I should change the color, right? Change red. So 
for p i received zero, one, zero, one, zero, zero, zero. Right? You see? So this is p. Okay, so now which so this is A, right? This is A fail because only one one. B, okay. B has two one. C fail, only one one. Right? So the error must be the guy who is living inside A and C. Must be this guy. Right? So it must be him. He is he is wrong. Right, because uh, it's, it's, it's obvious, right? Okay, so the correct word is so this is S3, so you have to change S3 from 0 to 1. So so this is the correct word. Well, it's quite simple, right? you, can, you, can, you can see. It. Uh, the same for, for A. Okay, so now we have to to, to, to Establish a second claim, which is it can detect two bit error, but it probably cannot correct it. So, the reason why can we detect two bit error is this. So, suppose you have, uh, suppose you have two mistakes, right? Now, we want to say that at least one circle will see, will see it. Uh, what do I mean? So for example, you have two mistakes, right? Uh, well, choose your favorite two. <laughs> okay, so maybe I see uh, S1, S3. Now in this case, circle B will see only one error, which is S1. But we know that if it's one, one error, he can see it because his parity will be gone, right? So no matter what you choose, you choose, say, S5 and S6. So in this case, oh, then, then it's even worse. A is wrong, B is wrong. So you can see two, two errors. So, so the proof essentially says, first you exhaust all possible cases. These are the five possible cases. Then in any of the cases, five cases, you can always detect. Or you can use this simple reasoning. In each of these, at least one circle contains a single error, just just one error, and then that circle will say, "Oh, something is wrong." Right? So, so it's quite easy to see. Uh, so the conclusion is, this Hamming seven four code can detect two bit errors, but it may fail to detect three bit errors. For example, if you have this case, then then no hope. You don't know. And also, it may fail to pin down or correct two-bit error. So for example, the two-bit error appear here, here, or here. You, the, the circle which report is A. In, in the three cases, only A notice report there's an error, there's an error, there's an error. But however, A does not, A cannot see where is the other x? It could be here, could be here, could be here. So therefore, uh, you can only detect. You are unable to to pinpoint. Right. So so this is the the property of Hamming code. Uh, sorry, sorry. So this is last bit. Uh, so the although it can not correct two-bit uh, transmission error. But suppose you don't receive any signal. You have a question mark, question mark. Suppose you have two, they call it erasure errors. So suppose a Hamming code uh, was sent and the word received is, is with two erasures, like uh, two question marks inside. So assume there's no error in the transmitted word, uh, then such a fault is called an erasure, and we can actually determine what is the original word. 
So, so we can find it by, uh, okay, is it easy? So, my fairy circle again, this time in red. So I receive one question mark, Let, let's call it X. Uh, and one, and let's call this question mark one. Okay. Then zero, zero, one. Can we find out x and y? Oh, okay, okay, so, so, okay, you know, you know, okay, right? So because, let's see x, right? x have to, to patch up everything here to be even, so there's only one choice. x has to be one. Uh, once you find x, y is easy, right? So, so I, I, I guess you know what, what I'm trying to say. So this is easy. So the, the theorem is, Erasure errors involving at most two bits can always be corrected. So the proof is, is just um, like in the, in, the, in the example. So uh, so that's the that's that's all I want to say for today. I, I'll upload this note this uh, uh, in a moment in, in, in ten minutes. And uh, next time we will. I hope I will finish the lecture. Uh, but in case we we need more time. I'll use week 12, uh, maybe a little bit. And then after that, I will, okay, so I will give you the last semester exam as for you to practice. And then we'll use uh, one lecture to talk about the solutions. I guess, uh, uh, and also, okay, so I, I will make announcements, say, what are the format and what are the, you can, okay. The format is the same as, as the midterm. It's a true or false or multiple choices. And uh, half sheet, same. One page, A4 size. Uh, I don't care if you write or you print. Uh, material, uh, it's, it's from week, week one to week 12. Uh, the optional ones, you, you don't need to. You don't need to. The, most of the optional ones are proofs. So you don't need to, to, okay, I hope you know the proofs, but uh, if you don't know it, uh, it's probably okay. Um, what else? I, I, will, I, will, I, will, I will write, I will write what I said down and uh, make an announcement on the, on the idea of, okay. Mm, is that okay? Okay, so. See you, hopefully see you next week.